Good morning. I'm Dr. Joe Maroon. I'm a neurosurgeon at the University of Pittsburgh, and I'm also a consultant, along with my associate, Jeffrey Boast, to ACTIVE. And as you know, in this time of high anxiety and stress in our world, depression, anxiety, uh, different emotions, many people feel out of balance. What's going on? What's it all about, Alfie, type thing. And, and I've had a considerable experience with uh, being out of balance myself. And over the years, I've given much thought to how does one recognize being out of balance? And number two, what do you do about it? And also, how can we prevent it? So what I would like to do today uh, with you is share uh, a talk uh, that I've prepared for you and, and also for my colleagues in medicine, talking about the three most important things in life and then elaborate upon that. So many times during my life, I've, I've considered what really is important. And if I ask you, the audience, what really is important to you? And three things consistently come to my mind. Number one is physical and mental health. Without that, we, we really are lost. Number two is relationships with God, family, friends, and colleagues. And number three, every day, I, I say carpe diem, thank the day, seize the day. So what I would like to elaborate upon today is the physical and mental health aspect of this. And to do that, I would like to mention a little bit about what is balance. And Claude Bernard was a physiologist in the 1800s who was studying the body and how it stays in balance. And he said, the stability of the interior environment of our body is the condition for a free and independent life, how our kidneys, our liver, everything works together. Walter Cannon, a physiologist at Harvard in the 1920s, coined the word homeostasis, or how our bodies stay in balance. And then Hans Selye, a physiologist in Canada in the 1930s, wrote about the adaptation syndrome. With any stress, there's initially resistance, then there's adjustment, and then there's acceptance or exhaustion. And in my own career over the years, I've, I've had significant success, but I've also experienced a period of time when I was a little overconfident, uh, a little arrogant, and if you would, and maybe uh, experienced the, the fault of hubris, which you recall the anecdotal story of Icarus, the mythological individual with his father, uh, Daedalus, who was imprisoned in a prison in, on the island of Crete, and to escape, his father made wings made of feathers and wax, but he cautioned his son not to fly too near the sun, lest the sun melt the wax, the feathers fall off, and he plummets into the sea. And as we know, because of overinflated ego and pride, he did indeed soar too near the sun when he experienced the, the hubris of flight and plummeted into the sea. Well, equanimitas is the is a Latin word for balance or homeostasis, as was talked about by uh, Cannon and Sellier and, and others. So I know there are a lot of highly intelligent people in this audience today, but I would like to remind you of another myth about balance that we are clearly more useful to society when a small part of us is overdeveloped than when we are whole people. And when you look at specialties, people get more specialized as they go up in the ladder. And sometimes they forget who's below them or how they got there. And at one point in my own life, I, was, I, I achieved a significant degree of success. I was appointed the chief of neurosurgery at the University of Pittsburgh Hospital. I was doing significant research and literally exsanguinating, draining the blood out of patients, operating on them, put the blood back in, and then for aneurysm surgery, uh, revitalize them. And then I was named the uh, consultant, the first consultant in the NFL as a neurosurgeon to the Pittsburgh Steelers. So I, I was flying very high with my successes, somewhat like Icarus, you might say. 
And then within the course of a, a week, my father died of a massive heart attack. My wife left in the middle of winter with our children and I had to quit nurse surgery. I was depressed, anxious, and, and fearful, fearful of hurting someone. So I left and I, I walked out of the operating room. And one day I was doing stereotactic surgery on awake patients, removing brain tumors. And the very next week I was working in this truck stop bequeathed to my mother by my father and uh, uh, wondering what in the world I was going, I was doing here. It was heavily mortgaged. She was distraught. We lived together in a farmhouse on the hill and I, for a year, pumped gas and filled up 18 wheelers uh, and flipped hamburgers at the Dallas Pike truck stop in Wheeling, West Virginia. Not what I had envisioned my life to be. Uh, and this was the farmhouse in the dead of winter that I, I was depressingly living in. And I came across this quote, the life of every man is a diary in which he means to write one story, but writes another. His humblest hour is where he compares the volume or the story as it is with what he vowed to make it. I certainly didn't intend to work in a truck stop the rest of my life having spent 15, 20 years in higher education. And uh, and during that period, I picked up a little book entitled, I Dare You, written by William Danforth, who was the founder of the Ralston Purina Company. And it was given to me as a high school present, so to speak, for a, as a leadership award. Someone, they gave these out to all the students in the country, the senior year, who had some leadership quality. But I kind of looked at it, yeah, this is a nice book, but it's not a trophy or a medal which I would have preferred. But for the first time, I really sat down and I read it. And what, what Danforth urged, he said, I dare you to lead a balanced life. And right now, ladies and gentlemen, all of you who are listening to this, please draw a square in your mind, just like this. Work, relationships, family, spirituality, and physical. And now I want you to draw a line commensurate with how much effort you put on each of these on a daily basis. My square looked like this. It was almost a flat line EKG. There was no relationships, spirituality, or my physical weight was 20 pounds overweight. I was doing nothing of an active nature. I was just working. And how many of you are like this today? You know, I would challenge you to really look at this in a very deep and meaningful way. So how did I come back? Viktor Frankl in his book uh, about, the, about Auschwitz, where uh, he was imprisoned during the war, said, happiness comes as the unintended side effect while you're doing something else good uh, or beneficial for yourself or others. Well, the banker who held the mortgage on the truck stop called me one day and said, let's go for a run. I said, I, you know, I'm exhausted. I don't think I can, but I finally managed. We made it around this track in Wheeling, West Virginia, four times. And I, I said, never again. But that night was the first night I slept in months. So I went back the next day and did a mile and a quarter, then two, then three, and pretty soon, I, I felt my depression lifting, my anxiety diminishing, and the food that I ate, I became more attentive to that. And I actually learned to swim <coughs> and I got a bike and read about triathlons and actually competed in a, in a tin man triathlon, a very short distance, uh, 300 yard swim, 10 mile bike and a 5k run and 
the more I did that, I was realizing there was a major unintended side effect of physical exercise related to the most effective antidepressant. I eventually continued uh, my training and completed the Hawaiian Ironman Triathlon uh, five times now. And uh, subsequently gave an awful lot of thought to why I was, I thought, programmed to die at age 60, just like my father. And then I read about the science of epigenetics. And as you may know, our genes are like a blueprint of a building. You lay them down, they do nothing unless they're acted upon. So what acts upon your genes to tell them which of 100,000 different proteins to make uh, in a miraculous almost way? Well, it's epigenetic factors, and those epigenetic factors determine really probably closer to 80 to 90% rather than 70% of our health, our mental processing, and our stability, and our homeostasis. So what are these epigenetic factors? So if they're very simple, it's things that we control every day if we choose nutrition, exercise, uh, what we take into our bodies in terms of toxins, our emotional health. So let's give an example. Let's say you eat a Big Mac infused with hormones and antibiotics, fried corn from Iowa sprayed with glyphosate or Roundup, and then eat an order of French fries with trans fatty acids, and then drink a bottle of phosphoric acid, commonly called Coca-Cola. Uh, what this is going to do is tell the transcription factors in the nuclei where your genes are to make inflammatory molecules. Inflammation is the common cause of heart disease, cancer, stroke, and Alzheimer's. So we are setting ourselves up by an injudicious diet for all of the diseases of aging that we acquire. What if we don't exercise and become a couch potato? Uh, fat is a deposition of cytokines in, in, in the adipose tissue in the fat molecules. Or if we overindulge in alcohol, smoke, uh, use narcotics or recreational drugs, or we don't control emotional stress. High stress and worry actually shrinks the brain. It's neurotoxic. So these are epigenetic factors that result in all of the problems that we're confronted with related to inflammation that I mentioned. In contrast, what if we have uh, a Mediterranean type diet, fruits, vegetables, appropriate protein, uh, good fats, not bad fats, polyphenols, and appropriate nutritional supplements? If we exercise, and what does exercise do to the brain? It releases molecules that result in the formation of new nerve cells, new connections with the nerve cells, and a condition called neuroplasticity, where we're able to take huge amounts of information, somewhat like I'm doing today, and then focusing it in a, in a spirited message, uh, as, as you see. And if we have clean soil, we don't smoke, we don't overindulge in, in drinking, et cetera. And emotional health becomes an extremely important anti-stress, anti-aging component. Religion, relationships, meditation, spirituality, prayer. These are all very effective ways to mitigate stress. Stress stimulates our hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, our hormonal axis to release cortisone, cortisol, which is a very stressful and destructive hormone in excessive amounts. And we also know exercise benefits the heart, the blood pressure, weight, less fat, and sleep is a critical fifth component in 
anti-aging, preventing the diseases of aging, and really preventing Alzheimer's disease. In, at night, when we sleep, uh, the beta amyloid plaque that builds up uh, like flotsam in a river uh, is removed by, uh, by various apolipoproteins in our blood and, and helps us. So I mentioned about exercise. It, it also reboots our brain. It literally increases serotonin, which is the antidepressive component of, uh, of SSRI, serotonin reuptake inhibitors, which are the most common drug prescribed in the world for depression now. And acetylcholine helps us think and remember, and also it enhances dopamine and anandamide which are feel good hormones. So we really feel good after we exercise. And David Sinclair, a good friend at Harvard, head of the anti-aging lab at Harvard, touts these factors in terms of a genetic influence of exercise. It activates survival genes called sirtuins. It inhibits mTOR, which is a, uh, a, a transcription factor that uh, results it is associated with a higher incidence of cancer. It lengthens telomeres, which progressively shorten as we age. It increases energy through NAD, increases new blood vessel formation, and naturally enhances the formation of mitochondria, so-called mitochondrial biogenesis, which produce ATP in our cells. So unquestionably, exercise is the best antidepressant you can have and it's free if you if you want to use it just walking 30 minutes a day can reduce the incidence of type 2 diabetes by 40 percent diabetes is the most common cause of blindness in adults amputations and kidney transplantation so think of what 30 minutes of walking a do a day, a day can do so we talked about stress how it attacks your body and the mind-body connection, how the things that we're, we're, the stress, exercise, diet, clearly through our mind helps our body heal. We know that the mind, depression, anxiety, fear can cause heart attacks, strokes, ulcers, irritable bowel syndrome. But it's bi-directional. The body if used correctly, can also heal the brain. The whole field of psychoneuroimmunology is associated therein. So I mentioned stress, it suppresses the immune system. It stimulates the endocrinological system to release cortisol and other neurotransmitters, creates anxiety and depression and insomnia. So how do we break this fatalistic type of uh, process? The most effective thing are all within our control. We talked about nutrition, exercise, and stress. Nutrition and health is the forefront. Every day, at least three times a day, you are going to make a choice. You're going to make a choice on what you take from a plate or a bag or a can and put into your mouth. So nutrition and health are hallmarks and keys to mental and physical health. So we know we should eat more fruits and vegetables. We should use whole grains, drink a lot of water, eat the right kind of protein, avoid bad fats and use Good, good fats, healthy oils. So these are things that everybody watching this will say, sure, that's what, that what needs to be done. But over 50% of people don't do this. One in five teenagers are obese, overweight. And it's not because they're following the guidelines that we're talking about here. So how can active help? Well, several years ago, my colleague, Jeff Bost and I uh, connected with David Brown, 
and reviewed the product list that they have, the things that they're doing. And we, we really did an in-depth evaluation of the various products that are contained in each of these products. So let's briefly uh, touch on, on each one. So deficiencies of butyric acid level. Well, that, what does that mean? Uh, what is butyric acid? It seems like uh, uh, kind of over my head, maybe. Well, let, let me explain to you. Our intestinal tract from our mouth to our anus is 30 feet long, 30 feet. It is lined by one layer, one thin layer of cells all the way. 90% of the serotonin that I mentioned earlier that we have in our bodies is made in our gut. 70% of our immune system, our ability to resist uh, foreign agents and, and toxins is made in the gut. And the most significant chemical in that area to enhance our microbiome, which are the trillions of bacteria two and a half to three pounds of bacteria are in our gut that make good substances or bad substances. Butyric acid helps, nutri nut helps nutritionally with the microbiome to make the appropriate hormones, the appropriate agents that keep us healthy. So it energizes the colon for better function, it decreases inflammation in our gut, enhances vitamin absorption, improves mood by, by manufacturing BDNF, serotonin, and dopamine, and also is a very important immune regulator. So that <clears throat> uh, you've, you've heard of the leaky gut syndrome. Well, this occurs because the mucus that lines the inner surface of our intestine uh, becomes deficient in various diminished energy states and, and infections. Butyric acid helps the thickness of the mucosa, helps seal off the leaky gut syndrome, and helps prevent diseases associated with the irritable bowel. What about inflammation in our joints? This is, this is an x-ray actually of my own knee showing uh, the collapse of the inner surface and osteoarthritis in my knee uh, from overuse, actually, uh, running, biking, swimming, and all these things. And what, what I've been taking now for several years to combat the inflammation is not ibuprofen that kills 17,000 people a year and hospitalizes 150,000 people a year because of its inflammatory process on the, on the stomach, but I've been using Optimin, which supports a healthy inflammatory response, reduces minor aches and supports joint mobility and flexibility. And that's because it, con it contains curcumin. Curcumin is, uh, uh, is a anti-inflammatory uh, used ex extensively in the Indian population from turmeric and uh, has a very powerful anti-inflammatory response, really equivalent to most of the over-the-counter over uh, anti-inflammatories, which are expensive and also have significant side effects. And because of its patented absorption properties with cycloc, cycloc uh, it gets absorbed where it's needed in the intestine. Um, and then a, another product that, that I, I like very much uh, is Genome X, Genomics. And this has three compounds, rosemary, gingerol, and luteolin. And again, these all amplify the release of another transcription factor called, transcription factor called NRF2. And again, this prompts a anti-inflammatory, anti-inflammatory response. And luteolin also is a very important antioxidant for the prevention of macular degeneration. 
macular degeneration in elderly is the most common cause of blindness. And this is a compound that uh, directly impedes that. So <clears throat> we, when we talk about calories, we know that excessive calories cause of excessive, cause excessive uh, deposition of fat, overweight, and all of the cardiovascular and other diseases that occur. So calories in, calories out. And the important thing when we say calories out, it means how, how do we burn calories? Calories is a measurement of, of heat or energy that comes from the carbohydrates, fats, and proteins that we consume on a daily basis. And if we consume a bottle of uh, soft drink, Pepsi, that has up to 12 teaspoons of sugar in one large bottle, can you imagine that? How would you like to sit down and just eat 12 teaspoons of sugar, 10 or 12? That's, that's what you're getting. Uh, and this leads to fat deposition, calorie deposition. And uh, we can't burn all that up so that when we have excess calories, it gets converted into triglycerides. Triglycerides get deposited in our fat and uh, our cholesterol goes up, our triglycerides goes up, our, uh, subject, our, uh, our subject ability to uh, develop heart attacks, strokes and Alzheimer's all are increased. So the, the boosting of energy and weight loss at the same time is a product called Aero. Uh, that contains fiber, which again, essential uh, for gut health. Uh, green coffee fruit, which is a stimulant like guarana, uh, helps to burn up fat and also releases BDNF that I mentioned that increases the formation of new brain cells. And chromium uh, polynicotinamate complex. Chromium is a an agent that is used widely uh, in, in health for health reasons to enhance the sensitivity of insulin. So insulin becomes more effective in driving sugar into, into the cells and not so much into the fat. So this is a, a fourth product that we feel uh, very confident in supporting and, uh, and one we use ourselves. So with that summary, I've, I've talked about the most important things in life, a healthy mind and a healthy body, relationships and carpe diem. And we've discussed in detail what a healthy mind and a healthy body is and, and how to maintain it. Uh, so with that, uh, Jeff Bost and I, thank you for your attention and, and hope uh, we've provided some information and takeaways to help balance your own life. Thank you.